It is a wonderful honor to welcome Professor Dror Ze'evi of the Ben-Gurion University in Israel for joining the program. Uh, we are discussing a book that he co-authored with uh, the eminent historian Benny Morris titled The 30-Year Genocide, Tur Turkey's Destruction of Its Christian Minorities, 1894 to 1924. Dror Ze'evi, shalom. Shalom <laughs> So I should first like to ask you, um, so how did uh, you and Professor Morris uh, come to collaborate on this project? Well, we're both in the same department at university, and uh, he was uh, writing mostly on Israel-Palestinian issues. I was writing more about the Ottoman Empire, and one day we sat together to have coffee in the cafeteria and he said you know there's no good book about the genocide of the Armenians everything I've read was very uh, partisan which means it's either pro-Armenian or pro-Turkish but there's nothing really uh, that's written about it in a, in a, in a, in a neutral manner so we, uh, we decided to take this upon ourselves and we combined our strengths. He, as a as an historian who wor works mostly on uh, issues of war, destruction, genocide, uh, so forth, and I, more on the Ottoman aspect of it. it. Took us about ten years to gather all the information and write this book. <laughs> okay, um, I understand that. Um... Uh, as of this recording, it's been five years since the book was published. Uh, the book was published in 2019. So uh, first, I'd yeah, like to cool. congratulate you two on um, uh, the fifth anniversary. Thank you. It was also, in the meantime, it was also uh, translated into Italian, Greek, Hebrew, and probably other languages are on the way. Yeah, so it's been, it's being translated. Wonderful. And, so I'd like to quote from the final lines of the book. Um, we, uh, by that, I mean, uh, professors Morris and Zabi, of course, approached this study with no political agenda. Our sole purpose was to clarify a fateful period of history. But in the years since we embarked on this journey, the true dimensions of the tragedy gradually unfolded before our eyes, document after document. We hope that this study illuminates what happened in Asia Minor in 1894 to 1924, that it will generate debate and, in Turkey, reconsideration of the past." Um, end quote. So with that said, to what extent has, um, has the book impacted um, the way Turkish people view their history? Well, it's hard to say. Uh, uh... I think it's not a linear process, first of all. I mean, I remember in the early 2000s, in, in say 2002, 2003, Turkish, the Turkish public and the Turkish media were very open to uh, studying and understanding what happened to the Christian minorities in the country around uh, World War I. But since then, and mainly since the uh, the takeover, you might say, by by the AK Party and Erdogan of uh, of the Turkish political sphere, it's become much harder to discuss these things. There was a total denial of of any kind of wrongdoing to the Armenians, except, of course, the question of displacement. I think I don't know how much our book has impacted this, but I think scholarship, general scholarship in, in general on the Armenian issue, on what happened in those days, is beginning to change, to shift, once again, shift positions in Turkey and maybe bring it back to the order of the day or to the agenda. So what motivates um, Turkish denial of the Armenian genocide? Well, uh, again, I'm, I'm, you know, it's... Uh, the, the strange thing is to be to be honest to be frank 
that the only people who ever apologized for a genocide like this are the Germans, who apologized for the Holocaust, gave reparations to the Jewish people and so forth. But most others, most other nations who have been involved in genocidal acts like this one have never, have always denied it and never apologized. And the same is true of the Turks. It's always very difficult to say that you are responsible for such terrible acts. And uh, there is also the question of course, of reparations, of, of trying to amend what's wrong. I don't think the Turkish people are ready for this. And I think in general, uh, the Turkey came out of the world war and the ensuing um, invasion of Turkey by Greece, by France, by England to some extent, by the Italians and the Russians to some extent, as as the wounded peer, as the wounded party as the victims of the war so it's very hard to to change position and say listen we may have been victims but we were also victimized other people to a great extent so it's it's difficult and um to what extent has that impacted uh turkish armenian uh, relations today Well, I can't say about the book. I know that there there are almost no Turkish Armenian relations. Uh, there's always a little sort of harbingers of of change. You see the uh, the border opening a little, maybe flights from Armenia to Turkey and and back. But relations have been always been very very tense, very very cold, and they haven't improved much in recent years. So especially because, as you know. There was a war between Azerbaijan and Armenia on the region of Nagorno-Karabakh in, in the midst between them. And Turkey was basically supporting Azerbaijan, like Israel, by the way, against Armenia. So uh, relations between Turkey and Armenia haven't improved. There wasn't uh, much improvement in recent years, mm -hmm. as far as I know. Mm -hmm. So... Um... You said in the beginning of uh, our talk that um, the purpose of uh, writing this book is to provide, um, I suppose, a more balanced overview of what happened in this uh, 30 year period. So um, would you mind giving us an overview of uh, the scholarship that exists before um, 2019, before you embark on this project regarding um, the Turkish Armenian genocide? Well, there, there was a lot of scholarship, uh, an immense amount of scholarship. This is, in at base, a very well-documented kind of period. I mean, from the 1890s to the 1920s. But it was always, uh, it was always in two parts. There was the, the, the Turkish side or those who sort of supported the Turkish the Turkish narrative, who were based mainly on Turkish archives, uh, on Ottoman archives, and, and claimed that everything written by foreigners, be it diplomats or missionaries stationed or travelers in, uh, in the Ottoman Empire, was, was basically a, a lie, a big lie, uh, created by those who were against the Turkish people. On the other side, there were the Armenians who uh, used very little of those uh, Turkish uh, archives and uh, created their own version of affairs, which I have to say, after studying the uh, the issue, we are convinced that this is more closer to the truth than the Turkish version. But they also, for instance, uh, the atrocities committed between the 1890s and the 1920s were not just against the Armenians. They were against the Greeks in the Ottoman Empire, against the Assyrians or the Syriacs, who are a Christian group based in mostly in eastern Anatolia. And they were almost, almost never mentioned. So, so even that 
was a very one-sided description of what happened. So I think what our work was to combine the Ottoman the Ottoman sources and the uh, and the foreign sources and uh, play them uh, against each other to see you know how they strengthen or not uh, the the points of view or the evidence brought in in each of those types of sources so we used turkish and arabic and and british and french and german and other sources uh to co to corroborate what we found there's a very very um uh a wide spectrum of sources that we used. <laughs> of course, uh, following up on the question of primary sources, um, you've indicated in the introduction that um, there are reasons to not trust um, the Turkish sources and uh, to favor the sources from um, Westerners, um, to quote here. Um, the main reason uh, not to trust the Turkish archives is that reliable sources um, contradict them. Uh, and you've listed examples of German, Austro-Hungarian, British, Armenians, uh, sorry, American and French documents. So uh, yeah. do elaborate more on uh, this uh, reliability of sources that you concluded. Well, uh, basically, sources are not reliable on any source is not reliable on its own but the truth is that uh, since world war one the turks have purged their archives of almost any evidence of uh let's say crimes against humanity in respect to the uh, to the armenians the greeks or the assyrians so what you can find in most Ottoman archives are descriptions of displacement, of exile. They took a group of Armenians from Samsun, from Trabzon, from Konya, from ever, and actually sent them away into the Syrian desert or to Syria. This is what you can find in the Ottoman, in the Ottoman archives. There is no mention of killing, there is no mention of massacres. There is no mention of people dying in their thousands of disease or hunger. But uh, but what happens is when you when you take the descriptions that you can still find in the Ottoman archives, say the description of of a group of people sent out from a, an Anatolian town in June. 1915 and then you put beside it the descriptions of diplomats officers even officers ottoman officers or german officers as you know the germans and the ottomans collaborated in the first world war or missionaries or american diplomats who were not part of the war at that time you get a much much more uh, elaborate kind of picture, also with the the massacres and the killings. So you can use the Ottoman uh, the Ottoman sources, but you can't rely on them as as the sole uh, indication of what happened, because they have been purged time and again. They've been purged uh, right after the war. Once again, they've been purged when the sources were dig digitized when they were open to foreign uh, researchers. So yeah, so there's a series of, of, of uh, actions performed on the archives to make sure that they do not in, uh, contain this kind of material. And so how would you and uh, uh, Professor Morris uh, respond to the criticism that, um, well, there were no intent of genocide to be found um, between in the period of uh, 1914 to 1916. Um, you've listed in, you've written in the book about the the historian Donald Luxon, who uh, denied that there were uh, an intention to rid uh, Anatolia or Turkey of 
um, Armenians or Christians in general. And I believe um, it was the Arabist uh, Bernard Lewis who also believed in the line that while the original plan was only to displace Armenians, uh, to send them into the desert rather than killing them wholesale. So uh, how would you respond? Yeah. Well, this this is, uh, to, su to some extent, this echoes what the discussion about the Holocaust, the German ho the Holocaust, because, because there, there was a claim that there was no intention for a final solution of uh, exterminating, you know, the Jewish people, the gypsies and so forth. And it somehow became this, this uh, genocidal project only later. Uh, as a as a result of of uh, uh, barbarization of of the war effort, and there's a very similar claim about the Armenian genocide or the genocide of the Christians that the Ottomans did not intend to kill them; they just intended to displace them, or maybe not even that. But you know, as the war dragged on and things became more difficult it became a genocidal project. Our sense, what we saw in the sources, is that there was indeed in the spring or in the, the late winter and spring of 1915, after the war began and before the, 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 the banish, banishment pro projects began, there was a series of discussions in the Ottoman uh, government, in the, actually, it's not the Ottoman, it's the Society of, of Union, Committee of Union and Progress. There was a series of discussions where they decided to do this, to actually destroy, annihilate the Armenian and later the, you know, the Greeks and the, the Assyrians, but mainly the Armenians at that time. There was a serious discussion about this, what was decided. And you can see that everything was, was planned to reach that point, you know, jailing the, uh, the elite, the, 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 the leaders of the community. And then you see um, sort of uh, synchronically at the same time, you see uh, um, caravans of Armenians being sent out of cities, and then the men killed on purpose in a very, very methodical way. The women and the old people and the children sent on their ways and actually being disposed of as, the, as, as these death marches went on. So our sense is that it, that, there was pre-planning. There was a, there was a plan in place in the spring of 1915. But even if it wasn't, you know, the the fact the acts were 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 committed. It's not a, it's exactly like the the question of the Holocaust. It was done. The question whether there was planning or not is uh, is secondary to the actual happening. Yeah. Yeah. So um. The book chronicles, again, the year 1894 to 1924. Um, much of the discussion of the genocide uh, is limited in the years um, 1914 to 1916. So I suppose in some ways, um, uh, this text is uh, aimed to paint a broader picture of um, Turkish-Armenian relations of that time. And of course, it spans um, three regimes, one is, the, the Sultanate of uh, Abdul Hamid the second, um, the second being the um, the Young Turks, and the third being uh, Mustafa Kemal and the birth of um, the Turkish nation state. Um, so, um, according to your research, what explains this constant antipathy that the Turks have with well Christians in general and Armenians in particular? Well. I think it's a, a it, it wasn't there before the 19th century. Let's let's be clear on this. This is not something that is part and parcel of Islam. My my uh, recent book that I just wrote that I just finished 
uh, um, discusses the 16th century. And in the 16th and 17th century, the Ottoman Empire was the best place for uh, people who were hunted in Europe, Jews and Christians of different beliefs and so forth. They all came to the Ottoman Empire and they were received there in op with open arms and they became part an important part of society. So it's not, it's not, initially it's not something inherent in either the Ottoman Empire or Islam. But in the 19th century, a, the, the rise of nationalism on the one hand, the rise of colonial forces, the British and the French grabbing parts of the Ottoman Empire, grabbing parts of India, grabbing parts of the Muslim world and the sense of being uh, perhaps persecuted, I think was part of the of, of this sense that the Christians in general, and the Armenians in particular, are traitors to the motherland. You know, the feeling was, we have been very fair with them, but they are uh, helping our enemies, or they are part of our of, of this world of colonialism, imperialism, and even the attempt to create their own nation, an Armenian nation. I think the combination of all these factors together created the climate in which uh, this series of, let's call them uh, genocidal acts, they're not genocide in general, but the genocidal act and, and, and ethnic cleansing uh, occurred. So you have this climate, and then you have a series of regimes who thought that they found a solution to this to this uh, problem, and the pro the solution is to get rid of this this treacherous uh, treacherous group. Let's destroy them. So it begins with Abdul Hamid II, the Ottoman Sultan, who thinks that if we give them a very strong uh, hit on the head, kill a few thousands or kill a few hundred thousands, then they will learn their lesson and behave. That doesn't work, but it leads to the second phase, which is the great Armenian genocide of, of World War I, where people have both decided that Abdul, Hamid's, Ad, Abdul Hamid didn't go far enough and that uh, that uh, and they learned the, the methods and they learned what was wrong with the first phase of this uh, of this ethnic cleansing and they did they did a better job and then Ataturk also comes to the same conclusion the Armenians are still here they're also collaborating with our enemies we should get rid of them and he does he finishes the job so that's how it goes now to follow up on your answer um so um this um you've uh, told the very fine line between um i guess um i guess denying the fact that um you know islam itself as a religion condones this practice of genocide but you've also uh, stated that the genocidaires uh, those who perpetuated this uh, large uh, crime against humanity they feel themselves to be justified by the Islamic religion. So I yes. guess uh, in a very short note, uh, uh, what, how, how did they use uh, the Islamic religion to justify this? Well, uh, in this respect, I guess you'll get different answers for me and for Professor Benny Morris. They, we think differently about this. My, my sense is that uh, Islam, like most great religions is a big warehouse of ideas and sayings. You know, you could find uh, sayings in Christianity that talk about love and self-sacrifice and helping your neighbor, but you could also find uh, sayings, you know, against other religions and so forth. That's true for the Jewish religion, and it's also true to Islam. If you if you want justifications for what you do, you can find it. You can find in Islam justifications for 
the love of your neighbor, for being very civil, for respecting other religions and so forth. And you can find other sayings by the Prophet Muhammad or by his followers that say you must kill all the apostates, you must kill all the heretics, uh, you know, the Islam is the only true religion and so forth. And I think the people who committed these acts, and as I say, they committed them uh, with a combination of budding nationalism and a sense of being persecuted, and of course a sense of Islam being uh, being on the uh, sort of going down in the world. I think they found justifications in Islam. So for them, for most of the perpetrators, for most of those who did these acts, they could say, we are doing it in the name of Islam. We are doing it because they are heretics. They broke the treaty, the dhimma, the treaty between Islam and other religions, and therefore we're justified in killing them. So it's not Islam, but it's the use of Islam for that purpose. I see. So um, were there any, I guess, um, Islamic justification to oppose uh, these uh, acts of mass killings on the Turkish side? Yes. Uh, one thing that isn't noticed enough in, I think, in the literature about the Armenian genocide is that there were many Turks, not the majority, of course, but there were quite a few Turks and other Muslims, Arabs, for instance, who, uh, for religious reasons, helped the Armenians, hid them in their houses, gave them jobs, uh, you know, were opposed to the killing and found ways to to help. Among them were sometimes religious people like, you know, clerics, uh, uh, muftis and qadis and people who know religion and people who work with religion who were opposed to, uh, to the massacre of Armenians or Greeks or Assyrians and fought against it. They were not a majority. They were, uh, they were relatively few, but they were there. Absolutely, yes. Of course, uh, that brings me to um, again. I, I don't want to dive too much into um, Islamic theology, but um, I, I would like to touch on the competing status of uh, what is uh, called dimi in, um, in I guess Islamic um, law. Um, so, from my understanding, as a very poor novice scholar of um, Middle Eastern affairs. Um, it, that word means uh, those who are not of um, not of the Muslim religion, who are not is Islamic. And um, you've uh, outlined that uh, in the 16th century, the Ottoman Empire saw the status, the status of Dimi as kind of a protected minority. So Jews and other um, Christians are can live a peaceful and, I suppose, prosperous lives while uh, keeping their faith. But um, things changed in the 19th century, and the status of Dimi now um, kind of carries the status of a, a despised minority. So um, give us an outline of how um, the status of Dimi or Dima um, has changed um, between these centuries, 16th and 19th. Well, basically, the status of uh, of Dimi is a, a, accorded to or awarded to people of the religion of the book, religions of the book, which means basically Christianity and Judaism. But later on, they also included Zoroastrianism and other variations of the theme. Basically, they are people who believe in God in the in the monotheistic religion. Uh, but do not believe in Islam. Uh, this this is a kind of of contract that the Islamic nation uh, has with these people, saying, you know, you deserve all the rights that Muslims have, but you deserve to live in peace. You deserve to prosper. 
you could do anything uh, you want. You can live anywhere you want. And uh, provided you pay a certain tax, a uh, what it's called the jizya, and uh, you refrain from certain actions, you don't you do not build new houses of prayer and so forth. You do not ride a horse or carry a sword. Uh, historically, these 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 contracts were not always adhered to. So there were times when Jews and Christians were free to do many of these things, and there were times where they were more restricted. I can say that in the 16th century, for instance, or the 17th century, when uh, Jews Jews were, of course, uh, exiled from Spain, as you know, and Portugal, and other places in uh, in Europe, they found many of them found refuge in the Ottoman Empire. We're talking about thousands of thousands of Jews running away from Christian Europe into the Muslim Ottoman Empire. The same is true for Protestants who were sometimes uh, um, hunted or persecuted by the Catholics, Unitarians and other uh, Christian minorities or or. Christian heretical beliefs, they were all found refuge in the Ottoman Empire. And they were allowed to live there and prosper. And this was also, in, in a sense, true for the 19th century. I think it started to change sometimes in the 1860s or 1870s, when uh, after a long period of what is called Tanzimat, a series of reforms in the Ottoman Empire, the ruling elite felt that those dhimmis, those people who were accorded special privileges as non-Muslims were uh, getting uh, too cheeky, too, uh, they, 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 were, they were challenging the rule of Islam. They were fighting for their own autonomy. Sometimes they were talking about independence from the Ottoman Empire. They were given uh, passports and privileges by the European powers, by the British and the Germans and the Austrians and the French. And in, in a way, they could rise above their Muslim peers. They, they had more options. They could be judged by others, not by the Ottoman Empire and so forth. And I think this somehow created this sense of being cheated by the people who were, you know, uh, who you gave all these liberties to, they became more powerful than you are. And I think in that sense, uh, this this idea of dhimmi started to change. And, uh, and you see that from the 1880s onwards, it becomes very, very serious. <laughs> Now, what uh, really surprised me uh, when reading the book is um, the large extent to which um, the Kurds, the Kurdish people, participated and collaborated in the mass killings of Armenians and other Christians. Um, I understand that today um, the status of the Kurds in Turkey, as well as in the other countries in which they are a minority, including including Iraq, um, is uh, is very precarious, to say the least. So um, what did the historical records show when it comes to Kurdish collaboration in the uh, extermination of Christians in, in Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire as well as Turkey? Well, it, uh, I, I, think, I think it was a classic case of divide and rule. Uh, the, the Ottoman authorities in the uh, late 19th century had two problems in their eastern, mainly in their eastern part of, of Anatolia. One was the Kurds and one was the Armenians. And they decided to play one against the other. And they chose the Kurds for logical reasons. They are Muslims and they were perhaps, they felt that there was more kinship between uh, between them and and the Kurds, but what they did is is in the in the late nineteenth century they created these regiments of Kurdish 
uh, soldiers to whom they gave salaries and ranks and weapons and horses, they were supposed, officially, they were supposed to guard the borders of the Ottoman Empire against Russia mainly. On one side were the Russian Cossacks, on the other side were the Kurdish regiments created by the Ottomans who were supposed to guard the border. But another mission that they had was keeping the Armenians down, was, uh, was, was doing the Ottoman Empire's dirty work with the Armenians and, uh, and, and enjoying the spoils, of course, when you, when you massacre a group of Armenians or a village, then you enjoy the spoils. So you could have that and you could have the salary and the horse and the weapons from the Ottoman Empire. And this sort of created this, uh, this sense of collaboration between the authorities and the Kurds. And this continued during the First World War. Uh, once, the, once the authorities, the Turkish authorities were done with the Armenians, there were almost no Armenians left and almost no Greeks left and almost no Assyrians left the next minority to suffer from this same problem was the Kurds themselves. And at that time, they became the persecuted minority. And when you talk to them now, many of them say, we made a terrible mistake at that time by persecuting the Armenians, but they were definitely a weapon used by the Ottoman authorities and the Turkish authorities later against, against the Christians. <laughs> Um, the, the reasoning was you're Muslim, they're Christians, they have they have uh, raised in rebellion against against Islam. So this is what you should do. You should uh, you should help us in <laughs> Okay. Um so to what extent throughout these uh, three periods? Um so how do I ask this? Um if, uh, say, a Christian were to, uh, say, repent and convert to Islam, um, um, how what is his or her faith uh, compared, like, between all these three periods? Well, first of all, this is one of the main differences between, say, the Armenian genocide and the Holocaust of the Jews. Uh, a Jew would, even if he would convert to Christianity or... An, announce he's only German and not Jewish and whatever, it wouldn't help him or her. They would still be uh, captured and sent to the sent to the death camps. In the Ottoman Empire, uh, converting to Islam would most in most of, in most times would help you. At the first period, definitely uh, people would entire villages would con convert to Islam just to escape the um, the fate of those who remained Armenian. And you find, even today, you find many villages in Eastern Anatolia whose ancestors were Armenian Christians and they converted as a group and they became Muslim. And they're still Muslim, but they, they remember that past. Um, this became a problem in the during World War One, because there were so the the authorities were so keen on banishing and destroying and killing the Armenians that they wouldn't accept even the idea of conversion. So there were times and there were places where Armenians were allowed to convert and uh, and stay alive even if they were banished from their original places. And there were other times and other places where even if they wanted to convert, uh, they were not allowed to. And they were said, okay, you first of all, you go on your way to Syria or wherever, to the, to the uh, deserts of, of Syria, and then we'll talk about conversion. So this idea of conversion came and went. There were times where they were allowed to convert. There were times when they were not. 
And there was one other point that's important, and I think, and that's the point of women. One of the means of genocide was, of course, taking the women. When you took the women, uh, there was no problem. You know, you could take any woman, a Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist, and that's fine. And hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of Christian women were taken, either raped or brought into the household as servants and slaves or married, and their, their uh, children became Muslim. So... Uh, that was also a way of surviving. You you were married. You were taken by uh, as as a woman by uh, by an Ottoman officer or by a Turkish soldier or something, and you became a Muslim or at least a Turk in that respect. Nobody really, I think, nobody really forced them to convert. But that was that was almost uh, inherent in the situation. Now, I'd like to move on to uh, the Young Turks, um, whose uh, reception has have been, well, mixed. Um, on one hand, they were regarded as reformers. They brought about um, Turkish constitutionalism and um, parliamentary democracy, among other things. But as you've mentioned, the Committee of Union and Progress, uh, which were the principal architect of the genocide, were an institution formed by the Young Turks. So um, how would you square uh, both of these things? Well, uh, um, I really believed in the ideas of democracy, progress. Can you hear me? I see there's a problem with me. Okay, everything uh, okay? I, I'm saying uh, most of them did believe in their modernist ideas of, you know, becoming a democracy, a parliamentary democracy, bringing in the minorities and so forth. But a series of, uh, of encounters and problems and political struggles during the first three or four years made it clear to the... Uh, heads of the Committee of Union and Progress that uh, like that and and their their politics became darker and darker. I think you can see it in many uh, uh, sort of regimes who start out as as democratic or republican and and somehow become autocratic or totalitarian. It's it's something that happens in uh, those struggles to stay to survive and stay in power, and that's what happened, I think, to the Committee of Union and Progress. They uh, they became more ruthless in order to to stay in power. The people who were more um, say autocratic among them, you know, Talat, Jamal, Enver. Uh, became much more powerful. They pushed the others aside. And by 1914, by the beginning of World War I, I think they were fully autocratic. They didn't want, uh, they didn't believe anymore in these uh, modernist ideas, except in a very, very uh, abstract form. And they, they got much closer to the idea that the non-Muslim minorities in Turkey should be dispensed with, should be destroyed. Uh, I think the two Balkan wars fought in 1912, 19, 1911, 1912, the terrible massacres that happened in the Balkans, in Greece, in Bulgaria, um, made them believe that there was no solution for the empire but to destroy this element, this uh, Christian element, which they saw 
as treacherous, which they saw as a danger to the empire. I think they really believed that this is the only way uh, to do it. And that's that's how they were transformed very slowly from a democratic, or at least in principle, a democratic group to that dark, a genocidal uh, rule of 19, 1915 to 1917, say when the, actually until the end of the uh, of the empire. I suppose uh, one can draw a historical parallel with the um, Committee of Public Safety in the French Revolution. No? Yeah, yeah, I think that was more or less the same kind of um, of drive that begins with very strong revolutionary ideas and and become very soon become darker because uh i guess it's it's these two the the combined uh motion say of struggling to stay in power against very strong forces arrayed against you and the fact that as this thing goes on um the people who are more attuned to that dark kind of of uh, of of power people who are more ruthless people who are willing to use the guillotine to achieve their goals they come to the fore they become more stronger and i think that's hap that's what happened there too <laughs> okay um so we've uh, talked much about the Armenians, but uh, I think um, it's worth shedding some light on the Greeks and Assyrians, who were also victims of um, Turkey's uh, genocidal efforts. Um, so I wonder, according to the timeline, uh, were these populations, the Greeks and the Assyrians, um, considered as targets um, after the Armenians or in concurrence with the Armenians? Well, uh, there were blinks of of uh, of um, seeing the Greeks as as uh, the culprits in this affair even before the war. The main effort before the war and during the war was against the Armenians. But there was there was suspicions that the Greeks are helping the Greek army even before the war during the Balkan Wars. There was a uh, there was a drive against the Greek population of the Aegean region and uh, the European part of of Turkey, and um, and after the war, especially when the Greek army invaded Anatolia. In 1922, 1921, 1922, uh, this this became uh, a real danger in in the eyes of Mustafa Kemal and his army. They saw the Greek invasion of Anatolia as connected to the Greek population. Although, as far as we know, there was no coordination, and and the Greeks in in Anatolia saw themselves more as Ottomans than Greeks. They didn't really, they didn't really see themselves in nationalist terms, in national terms. They saw themselves as culturally Greek, even though you could say that many of them did not speak Greek. They spoke Turkish, but they did not see themselves as part of Greek statehood or Greek nationhood in that sense. They were Greek religiously rather than nationally but at that point i think uh ataturk and uh, his army decided that they presented a big danger and this is when the big um series of massacres and genocidal acts against the greek happened both in the aegean region and in the pontic region that is to say on the shores of the black sea and inside and uh, yeah so you see sort of uh little reminders of 
the problem that the Greeks uh, the Greeks um, posed to the to the to the rule of the uh, the Committee and Union program, and then Ataturk, but becomes full force during uh, say or, you know the the Greek invasion and uh, around it. <laughs> So to what extent was um, Turkish nationalism, uh, and we're talking under Mustafa Kemal now, um, used to justify um, the extermination of uh, the Christian populations? Well, uh, if you look at it as a continuum, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, there is no clear sense of Turkish nationalism. Nobody really knows what Turkish nationalism is. We're talking about an empire. There are no borders of a Turkish nation. <clears throat> People like, <clears throat> sorry, Ziya Gökalp, who is the uh, so the uh, the ideologue of the Committee of Union, talks about a big Turanian nation that includes. You know, the Turks, the Azeris, the Uzbeks, the Uyghurs, all this all this huge stretch of land from China to Europe. Uh, but there is no sense of Turkish nationalism. There is there are very vague ideas. And I think for most people at that period, there was kind of an equation between Islam and Turkism. You talked about Islam and Turkism, you talked more or less about the same things. For most people, simple people's minds. As we move along during the war and mainly after the war, the idea of Turkis Turkism or Turkishness becomes clearer because this is part of Ataturk's, but this is part of Mustafa Kemal's ideology. Say, no, we're a nation, we're called Turks, these are our borders, this is who belongs and this is who doesn't. So I would say in the early 1920s, there's also there's already a, a clearer idea of Turkism. Although it's still vague, it's clearer than it was before. And I would say that it plays more of a role in the persecution of the Greeks after the war and the, the remnants of the Armenians than it did before. It's becoming a national struggle instead of a, for most people, for the simple people, it'd be, it'd, instead of a, a religious struggle against Christians, it becomes a nationalist struggle against those who are not part of the nation. And I think this is a, this is a major uh, motivation in, in those later years yeah until let's say 1924 1925 when uh, you know there's the population exchange and and almost all these christian minorities evaporate basically they're not there anymore from 20 percent of the population they become less than two percent now uh you've led me to uh perfectly to the next question which is um give us an outline of the status of Christianity and the Christian population in today's Turkey. Well, there's, there's there's there isn't much to talk about. There is there are a few thousands. Uh, it's hard to say to give you numbers, but I think all in all, the number of Christians in Turkey is less than one hundred thousand. We're talking about a nation of eighty thousand or eighty million or more people. The Turkey, the Turkish nation maybe around a hundred thousand maybe just a little more are greeks armenians and uh, i see other that there is a a tiny protestant community there's a tiny catholic community significant they're not you know they're less than one percent i think less than half a percent of the population so uh that's all that's left today in turkey very, very few, and maybe 20,000 Jews. Okay. So 
So final question. Uh, we've begun our conversation on the historical reckoning process. Um, so what do you hope that a, a historical reckoning from the Turkish side would look like? Well, I, uh, you know, I have many Turkish friends and I hope that I, and I know that most of them feel this way. They feel that there was a genocide, <clears throat> clearly, that uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of people were killed by the sword, by hunger, by illness, on purpose by the Ottoman and then the Turkish authorities. And this should be recognized. I don't think any more should be done of this. They should say, yes, this was done. We're guilty of it. It was a, a hundred years ago. There's no nothing we can do now about this to rectify the the damage or the uh, the extent of injustice done. But we recognize that that this was that, and uh, and we want to be to be to have cordial relations with the Armenian people, with the Greek people, and so forth. They haven't done that until now. Okay. Well, on that note, thank you very much, Professor Dror Zaevi, for joining the show. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure, Chong.